And uh, we're looking forward to presenting to you some information that we've developed over past, oh, there, thank you, past, <laughs> <laughs> the past couple of years and uh, relating before the pandemic and what's going on now with the pandemic. And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Graves, who would probably like to say a few words about the foundation so that you understand what we're doing. Hey, everybody. How are you? How are you tonight? Well, it's tonight in Chicago, which is where I'm from. <laughs> so I woke up this morning like, how did you stay in bed at this late? Because I didn't, I, I never feel completely rested because I'm working. I get up and I work two hours ahead of this eight o'clock, which is six o'clock <laughs> for us. And I'm like, Chandra, how, how did you oversleep? It's only eight o'clock. It's seven o'clock here. Sleeping until it's nine o'clock is oversleeping for me. So it was nine o'clock in Chicago. It was crazy. Anyway, uh, my name is LaShondra Grays. I'm the founder and CEO of Apartment and Housing Rentals Foundation. Apartment and Housing Rentals Foundation is a 501c3 organization. And what we do is eviction prevention and second chance rental. I founded this organization seven years ago on Facebook. I am a, I'm also a social media marketing professor. And so I've been doing social media marketing for 14 years. So I founded a whole nonprofit organization using Facebook, by the way. So this is why we are here to talk about this eviction situation. So as you guys know, the housing market has been in an uproar. The real estate market has been in an uproar due to the pandemic. But what you might know or might not know is that it was predicted that we were going to have a housing market crash in 2020. So now everybody is focusing on these evictions or these pending upcoming evictions. But let me tell you something. Let me tell you why Apartment Housing Rentals Foundation was founded and our eviction prevention and second chance rental program allowed us to go national, even though we had an online model since 2016. So we were helping people with the second chance rental and the eviction prevention program and states where we had never even met the person or traveled to that state. And we were doing all this from Illinois. Evictions has always been a problem, you guys. Ever since the 2008 housing market crash, okay, it has always been a problem because the rental industry saw a boom in 2008 when everyone was losing or selling their properties. So when that happened, from 2008 until 2019, that's 11 years, market rental prices went up almost 93%. Well, in some cities, some states like Texas and California, the market rental prices had went up 93%. And having those market rental prices go up 93%, the impoverished or the uh, minimum wage worker was already outpriced in the market rent. And that's why people are talking about there, there's a lack of affordable housing. That being said, what was the result of the minimum wage worker, which is now an essential, we know them now as an essential worker. What happened was, and since they were outpriced, evictions came, uh, started to be on a rise. And so in 2016, um, the eviction lab stated or they had research done on evictions in the United States. And in 2016, there were 2.6 million evictions filed in 2016 across the United States. And there were 900 evictions. And I'm talking about families. I'm not talking about people. I'm talking about families. There were 900 evictions that actually went through in 2016. That trend kept happening uh, post-pandemic. And so the last time we did any research on that, that was in 2019, right before the pandemic happened. So I want you guys to know that the pandemic did nothing but make what was already an issue rise to the top. And now it's, we call it the elephant in the room for the most part. 
What happened to Apartment Housing Rentals Foundation? Well, what supposed to happen to it? We have a seven-year-old eviction prevention program. And so since we've been doing eviction preventions for seven years and what, four years nationally, almost five years nationally, then we're the experts when it comes to eviction prevention. Um, we have a couple questions so that we can guide my talk. I just want to give you guys a little background on the problem that we're facing right now. So since I gave you the background, let me bring you up to where we are now. The numbers that, that they're giving out, saying that there's 40 million households that may be evicted because there's a national eviction moratorium, and now they're saying that there may be 10 million households, 30% of America rent. 36% of America rent, okay? 36% of America rent. That is a big number. And so, yes, we have about 40 to 10 million families that may be uh, evicted or taken to eviction court um, on June 30th. Well, no, it's not going to be on June 30th. I'll tell you guys when the eviction moratoriums will be extended to when we go through the actual information. Right. Uh, one of the things that uh, we wanted to point out to you is that this eviction problem is not just a problem for tenants and for landlords. It's a problem for the banks who hold the mortgages that landlords haven't been, been able to make payments on, that those landlords are having a um, uh, forbearance issue coming at the end of the, of the moratorium when they decide to finally uh, close them out. And that some of these people, the tenants, are as much as $50,000 behind in rent. And it's a huge, huge problem. And what we're trying to do is find grant money to help with providing the landlord, for example, with a little bit of cushy, uh, not cushy, that's not the word I want, a loan uh, that's a very low interest loan that an interest rate loan that the would be paid off by the tenant who we help to stay in the current property with an, uh, uh, a situation where they work out a payment program with the landlord. So what I want to ask Lashandra is um, how can the small independent landlords survive eviction moratoriums if tenants use the really um, the rulings that have happened to them as an unfair advantage? Well, to me, of course, we wrote those questions down, so I only wanted the good questions. So, to me, <laughs> that's a great question. <laughs> Let me tell you guys, um, because Apartment Housing Rentals Foundation deal with the landlord and the tenant, because that's the only way an eviction prevention program will work. I'm sorry, is everything okay? Yep, I'm good. That's the only way an eviction prevention program will work is if we do mediation. And so our program is all about mediation. That good question, can you say that good question again? I can. How can the small independent landlords survive eviction moratoriums if tenants use the ruling as an unfair advantage? Okay, you guys, not all tenants are using the ruling as an unfair advantage. That's the one thing I have to point out. But there are a lot of tenants that's using it as an unfair advantage. So it's all about risk right now for the small property owners. I have two spaces on a site called Cora. It's a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, information site where you can go and figure out and ask questions about anything and you'll get the answers from um, experts or um, your peers and so forth. So I like to use Cora. I have two spaces on Cora. And one of the, that question came from one of the spaces and they got about 200 answers, okay? So I wanna read the answers to that really made sense. And it will tell you why the small landlords may be in trouble but it'll give me a basis on telling you how they don't have to be. Right, so 
All right, and so this question was answered, that question was answered in one of my spaces. I have two spaces on Quora. One is the housing market um, during, the, uh, during COVID-19, and the second space is named evic the ev Eviction Prevention Program. And this is the answer to that question. He said many want, this, this gentleman said many, many landlords won't. Many that do survive will sell their property and walk away. A lot of people, including myself, don't want to be in this position again. We never imagined the government will step up and force us to let people live in our property rent free for almost a year. Millions of people are praising the moratorium, but it's only going to cause rents to skyrocket. There will be less supply of rental homes, more people that can't qualify for a mortgage uh, to buy their own home. Those that stay in the business will have to adjust their risk management in case this happens again. Higher reserves, larger budgets, higher tenant requirements, et cetera. In the past, we calculated risk by factoring in an average vacancy rate for the area and the carrying costs associated with the property for that length of time. It's obvious now a few weeks won't cut, the, won't cut it anymore. You should be prepared to be stuck with a property generating zero rent for months, maybe even a year, and having to, cover, having to carry those costs on multiple properties at the exact same time. The math just doesn't add up for me anymore, anymore, and I doubt it will for many single family, land, many single family landlords. Apartments will probably be the only thing that still makes sense or switch from single family residential to short term um, vacation rentals. But there are so many restrictions on Airbnbs right now that you're still taking that risk that the local government can shut you down in a year or two. While we're still taking, um, while we're still taking restrictions, many uh, neighborhoods are even enacting rental restrictions right now too. So tenants have the right to not only skip rent, but they're, um, they're not keeping up the yards and so forth. And I liked, we had 200 answers to that question in my group, in my space on Quora. I love this answer was the one that really made sense because he talked about something that landlords, small property landlords are dealing with right now. I'm hearing that it's a seller's market right now. And when you, when you hear that it's a seller's market right now, then it's also a buyer's market right now. Why is it a seller's market and a buyer's market right now? This, this gentleman just told you, and he's a landlord. He just told you what's happening. Landlord, single family, um, single family rent, home rentals, landlords, they're trying to dump those properties right now. They want to sell those because if you're a landlord and you had 10 single family homes, you're renting 10 single family homes and you had eight of the tenants not paying rent and you still had to cover those carrying costs, you still had to pay the property taxes. If you were, if, Lord forbid, if you had a mortgage, you still had to pay the mortgage, the street of sanitation, they, they want the garbage picked up, so you still have to pay that. Most property owners um, pay water bill, I mean, insurance, all of that stuff you still had to take care of, but you had to take care of it on 10 properties. So these single family landlords, they're trying to sell their properties and they're trying to invest in multi-unit properties, which makes the most sense. Yes. what you only have one property tax on that one unit. So if you had a property that had 10 apartments and versus having 10 single family homes, you have to pay property taxes on those 10 single family homes. You only have to pay property taxes on one multi-unit property. Well, you still, but it's, it's less than having 10 different property taxes. It's less than having 10 different insurances. 
You know, if you had, you have to have property insurance. If you have 10 single, phone, uh, single family homes, you have to have 10 single family um, homes, uh, property, I mean, insurance on those homes. If you have one multi-level unit property, you have to have just one insurance. But this is what your question, it's where it's leading me into my next discussion, okay? Because the whole question was, how can these landlords survive? I'm telling you what's, what's the trend. Where I'm telling you the trend that's happening now. These landlords think they have to sell their houses because they're talking about all of these risk factors. Nobody ever thought that the government could have that much power to shut businesses down or to tell people that they have to let uh, tenants or somebody else live in their property for free but at the same time, not forgive or not have a moratorium on insurance premiums and <laughs> property taxes and things like that. Let me just uh, in, interject here from what I've seen from some of our customers who are subscribers to software for their property management. And that is that they've had to go into forbearance programs where they have a forgiveness for their mortgage payments for a certain period of time and the, it's up to the bank or it's up to the lender or the mortgage servicing company, whomever they're with, as to whether they have to pay the um, balloon payment of what's been held back on the forbearance or whether they can put it at the end of the, of the mortgage. And of course, everybody's trying to get end of the mortgage, but not all servicing agencies and banks are cooperating with that. So these people are going to be faced with these balloon payments here. The day, maybe they've already gotten notices for them because those forbearance programs usually aren't for the end till the end of the moratorium. They're for a certain period of time until the people can get back on their feet. And so it's all dependent upon the lender as to whether uh, they're going to be able to sell or keep their properties or whether they're going to be forced to sell because they can't pay the forbearance. And that's why I said earlier, we were looking for funding to have a pool of money for landlords to borrow low interest uh, loans to pay those forbearance amounts off because there's gonna be massive amounts of this, of this issue happening as soon as the, the moratorium happens. Awesome. And so <clears throat> to uh, move, um, to stay on topic of how can the landlord survive? We talked about the 10 different properties and having one property versus 10 properties. Apartment Housing Rentals Foundation is telling the landlords, do not sell. Don't sell your property for under, the mark, under market value because the housing market crash is happening right now. I mean, the pandemic didn't stop the housing market from crashing. It just made it kind of worse because when those evictions start rolling out, there's going to be a real problem. However, Apartment and Housing Rentals Foundation is telling our landlords, do not sell your property. Do not sell your property. Do not give up on your property. Yes, it, there's a higher risk. And yes, there's a, and that higher risk is um, coming in the form of a higher carrying cost. Uh, Lord forbid something like this ever happens. But Apartment and Housing Rentals Foundation eviction prevention program has been around for seven years. Seven years, we've been doing this before there was an eviction prevention problem, okay? And so what we did was we expanded the program and that expansion including, included having software made and provided to us from Smart Property System. Um, and I'm going to put our eviction prevention program up on the slide in a minute, yeah, I'll show you this. And I'm just gonna show you the, um, the PowerPoint, you guys. Okay. And so the most important part of this eviction prevention program is I wanna show you uh, a little information about the demographics of the clients that we worked with pre and uh, pros post the pan, uh, pandemic. Well, we can't say post pandemic because we're still going through it right now, but. So, in 20, uh, from 2014 to 2019, 
the medium income for our clients at Apartment and Housing Rentals Foundation was about $2,000. And because I um, tried to put the numbers up, you can't really see it. But the thickest um, lines, it's around $2,000 because minimum wage. These were minimum wage, so um, the minimum wage workers are the ones that have been outpriced when it comes to the uh, rental market. The market rent is unbelievable. So Apartment Housing Rentals Foundation, we only work with market rent because we're a hand up. We're not a handout, we're a hand up. So we only work with market rent. Our clients have to have jobs and so forth. So these are people that has been in an eviction or is in the middle of an eviction. And this is the demographics on them from 2014 to 2016. The medium income was about 2,000 for the, the sample of people that we deal with. You see the sample there, a sample of 766 people. Um, from 2014 to 2019, 30% of the people that filled out the application have already been evicted uh, once, and while 66% of them have never been evicted. Uh, membership bankruptcies, we have 14% of our members that had already declared bankruptcy, and this is from 2014 through 2019. A uh, few of our members had Section, uh, Section A vouchers because, like I said, Apartment Housing Rentals Foundation, although we are a 501c3 organization, we only deal in market rent. We're trying to teach people how to manage their finances. I mean, use the income they got and win with it. That's their hand. Somebody else could have that same hand and win with it, and that's what we teach people how to do. So that's why we don't have that many Section A um, voucher certificates in our program. Um, the unit sizes. So this was, this was the really big change that you will see um, because we also did uh, graphs for, to compare our members from 20, 14 to 2019, and then the graph that you're going to see now is going to show what's happening with our members in 2020 and 2021. The size of the, the units, that changed big time. So now 41% uh, of our members wanted a two-bedroom followed by a three-bedroom, which was 24%. You guys, I, can you guys see this? I'm a professor, so I'm used to like, reading four people. I think everybody, you, you see this, right? Got it, okay. Okay, so here's our um, 2020 uh, and 2021 demographics. So, and so uh, most of our members, 51, half of our members are in between the ages of 30 and 44. Can I ask you guys a question? because we're all in the real estate space. Why do you think the members are coming from us are that age? I mean, what's the biggest factor that could have made our demographics change so drastically that the half of our members are the ages 30 and 44, and they're looking for second chance rental or eviction prevention? Families, that's one. Student longs, that's two. Divorce, it's depend. That came from um, somebody that's with us. Who said divorce? Oh, you did. Okay, that's three, right? Everything you said is correct because thirty to forty-four is the childbearing, marrying. I mean, these are that age. This is you know that age group. However. The, the reason why we, we see that half of the members are coming to us for eviction prevention and second chance rental is because that age bracket was the ones who were laid off. Those were the people that was laid off during the pandemic. If, if you were a medium, if you had a, a medium, your income was considered medium income, this was the bracket that was laid off because the C-suites, they pretty much kept their income and the minimum wage, they were considered, you know, 
um, they were considered, what was that name called? First, first responders because we needed, you know, people to work at the Walmarts and get the gas and, and to cater to the, the first responders. I, want, I don't want to say real first responders, but we needed them to cater to the first responders. It was, this is the middle class right here. This is, these are the people that was laid off. Uh, did I have another question? Okay. So then we're gonna go right down. And then under 30 was the next level, the second um, highest uh, um, for our program. <clears throat> Let's see. The next talks about the income. Okay, so the income was all over the place because Apart, because Apartment Housing Rentals Foundation is, we do not cater to um, subsidies. We, we're a market rent program and we get income brackets from all over the place. However, in 2014 and in 20, between 2014 and 2019, our demographics were at, you know, kind of steady at 2000. We knew that these were the minimum wage workers that were coming to us, okay? It's all over the place now course, because the income has changed or there were no income uh, during this pandemic. Uh, the gender, we didn't talk about the gender, but Apartment Housing Rentals Foundation has always been more female heavy as far as the membership is concerned. Uh, count of evictions, all right? The number is the same right now because the eviction moratoriums are continuing to ex be extended and I'll tell you when, it, when they're gonna be over in a minute. Uh, count of members with convictions. We didn't have a comparison chart for that, so that was just for us. Uh, count of members with bankruptcies. That number went up. The number went up because people thought that they could escape their um, situation, their financial problems through bankruptcy. And this graph shows the, okay, the bare room count. So remember the bare room count. Um, so our clients used to, um, they wanted to rent five bedrooms, four bedrooms, Two bedrooms, two bedrooms was the highest, followed by three bedrooms, but it went all the way up to a five bedroom rental. As you can see, it's concentrated now, like super concentrated where our members, yes. Is that me? I'm sorry. I have a question. Oh, yes. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but you're, you're going over all these numbers with, with the individuals and, and I understand that, but the question I guess on, on the rental, cause you're going, I guess, nationwide with this when people are finding you, what are you finding or, or what was the average as far as the rental price was concerned with these people that are going from two to $7,000 a month uh, on income? And then did you also do a breakdown on what their bills were, like income versus outcome? Because I would be curious to know like really where, where people fall into. Um, so that graph right there is just for our eviction prevention program. We didn't do uh, individual numbers for that, those numbers, but that's a good idea mm -hmm. if you, you know, it's something that we should do. However, we do have the numbers of the rental prices, if that will suffice. Um, and it'll be, it'll be aggregated by state. Okay, the, the average rental price, um, the average rental price that is the most prob problematic that we've seen so far has been in California. So like a two bedroom apartment in California, uh, the medium rent for that apartment is $2,500. 
and Mark in the minimum wage can't pay for a $2,500 rental unit. That's why states like Texas and California and possibly North Carolina, North Carolina where the rental, um, the, the minimum wage is seven um, under $8, they just raised the rental prices in Charlotte to match Illinois' rental prices, $1,000 for a one bedroom. Do you think that's gonna change? I know they're trying to uh, put up the minimum wage, but I, I'm in Louisville, Kentucky. But what would change is will we and Amazon hire 15 an hour plus bonuses? I mean, Domino's Pizza delivery drivers 15 an hour plus bonuses. And all these other places are 15 an hour, you know, or $15 plus. No, it's not going to change because, like we said, the pandemic has caused more problems in the housing market than just rent. Inflation is happening right now, and it's happening little by little. Inflation is going to happen anytime the government puts out trillions of dollars and at concentrated time within a couple months, and it happened more than once then you know that the inflation is bound to happen. And that's what we're seeing right now. It's just, it's inching up. And so that $14, that $15 minimum wage, that's not going to change anything because the rental prices are going to go up if they're going to be inflated again. And so the problem will never change when it comes to that unless the laws kind of change. And and there's another issue there too. As the um, uh, inflation continues to rise, the interest rates will go up too. And that will decrease the purchase power of people for buying homes. Yeah. Um, I wanted to get to talking about, can you tell us the parts of the eviction prevention program that the Apartment Housing and Housing Rentals Foundation has as opposed to some of the plans that are out there being offered at state, state and city levels. Okay, right. And you guys, yeah, like I said, I, I teach, you know, uh, 100 to 500 level courses. So yeah, my, my speeches can turn into a lecture pretty quickly. So thank you for <laughs> breaking that up. <laughs> okay, so what we did with our eviction prevention program, uh, there has been told that um, there has been re the research out there saying that about a thousand eviction prevention programs popped up within the past year and prob uh, probably about 400 of them popped up just since April. And what they're trying to do is all of the eviction prevention programs, they kind of look alike because they're using somebody else's model and the model goes like this. They don't use it, they don't say it's an eviction prevention program, they say it's an eviction resolution program. They don't understand that once a person gets an eviction on their name, they're homeless for one to five years. So this is what I'm forecast, that I forecast it is going to happen. The eviction moratorium, has, it's already been talk out there that the eviction moratorium will be extended until September, um, September 30th, 2021. Um, I just heard that North Carolina's governor just extended their eviction moratorium until July 30th, 2021. Um, you guys know that the eviction moratorium, the federal eviction moratorium only covered federal properties and subsidies and federal mortgages and things like that. And that's why every single state had their own eviction moratorium, okay? And so the federal eviction moratorium, they haven't came up with an eviction prevention program. And if they don't come up with something in about one week, having all of those landlords go to the, to the courts on June 30th, even if we have 
four states go to court on June 30th, the courts are going to be heavily weighed down. The landlords will not, uh, the landlords are protected to a point and they don't realize it. They're protected to a point during this eviction moratorium because they have a leg to stand on. But once that eviction moratorium lift without that protection, uh, without that leg, then they're going to be on their own. Every landlord is going to rush to the courthouse and try to evict. And as you know, there's, an, there's a process to try to evict and the, the sheriffs will have to put the people out so the landlords could be stuck with that property not getting any rent for six months to a year. So you're still at, without any protection or any leg to stand on. And this is what the, the eviction resolution programs look like right now. They're telling people, okay, let the landlord put the eviction on you, and then the federal government will give you money for a lawyer. But if a person get evicted, they're going to be evict They're going to be homeless for at least one to five years with that eviction on their name. It's going to be even worse because landlords are not going to rent to someone with an eviction that popped up. And that eviction was put on their name in 2020 and 2021. There, it's just not going to happen. No landlord will rent to anyone like that because they went through so much. So our eviction prevention program differs in that we're trying to get to the landlords before they even put the eviction on the tenant's name. So if we can get to the landlords before they put the eviction on the tenant's name and work out the mediation and start having that tenant paying rent right now, and come into a payment arrangement that will save the landlord so much money, the court costs, and guess what? We're known for our second chance rental programs. So if the landlord don't want to do a mediation, then give Apartment Housing Rentals Foundation enough time to move the tenant out. Because if the tenant get the eviction on your name, on their name, nobody's going to rent to them, and it's going to take the sheriff months if not a year, to get to you because so many people want to run and evict right away. And it'll be hard to move the tenant. And that's why Apartment Housing Rentals Foundation eviction prevention program differs. And so we teach our tenants tenants rights and responsibility, um, budgeting. We teach them how to deal with their money and we teach them and we give them resources. May It, it may be workforce development, it may be mental resources or whatever, but we're teaching people how to be tenants because apparently they don't know how to be tenants. It's not like everyone that isn't paying rent or wasn't paying rent didn't get any income. But when I got my first apartment, nobody said, oh, Chandra, before you get that apartment, you better go learn your tenants' rights. We're on uh, the verge of trying to teach every tenant in every state, their tenants' rights because tenants really don't know how, don't know how to um, be a tenant. One of the things that we found that's so interesting in these classes that we offer, which are required by the way, uh, they have to finish the classes before we will place them or before we will work with them to get a workout for their eviction, and we do that for a good reason. Nobody's ever taught some of the most of these people how to budget. They have no idea no how to idea. use their money. And so they get paychecks, and they saw a new pair of shoes that they really want to buy. They're just as likely to go buy the, the shoes and not get the full amount of rent paid. These people have had the comments that they make when they're in, this, in these uh, class sessions are absolutely amazing. Why didn't anybody ever teach me this before? Mm -hmm. I never knew that. I never knew how to do that. And we have a whole system that's taught by a college professor with a booklet that teaches them how to budget. And it's absolutely made a change in their lives. And so that's a very important part of our program. Yep. That's a very, very important part of our program. And then case management. We went a different route. Apartment Housing Rentals Foundation, instead of, um, because we're in the IT era, and I, I'm not against that because I'm a social media marketer. I've been doing social media marketing for 14 years, and I've always done it, uh, projects with, um, with the University of Wisconsin, uh, Wisconsin Technical College, the Technical College System for the Renewable Energy Summit. That was my biggest gig for social media, and that was in 2008, okay? Um, 
and I'm a, I'm a social media professor, so I, I'm, I'm happy with social media. I don't mind the IT era and things like that, but we went a different way. Um, we went the opposite route. So what we did was we started hiring social workers. That's not IT. Social workers uh, can't be, you know, they need to be face-to-face -face even if it's just on the phone and managing our members. And what the social workers is doing is they're requiring the tenants to um, upload a monthly budget. Um, they're making sure that the problematic tenants um, a week or two, a week or two before the rent is due, they're, that they're working on their rent. And they're able to do this efficiently through the smart property system software that smart property system uh, gave us. It's an online property management system. And all they did was explain that because, yeah, that's not my, my language. Okay. <laughs> it's property management software is something that even persons with one unit can benefit from. And there are many kinds out there. I'm going to be talking with you about that later in the week. On Friday, we're going to talk about the new technology available for property management software. But basically what we wanted to do is to be sure that all of the people that were in our system had a way, an audible, an auditable method to track rental payments where the rental payments are being tracked and not only tracked but accounted for in an auditable system where there's a, um, a result presented not only to the landlord who's managing this, that tenant but also to the tenant so they can look at their account history and find balance due and make sure that they're getting everything done the way they should. And it's online, they can use it on their phone or a tablet or on a computer if they've got one. And uh, it's very important for us to be able to track the payments so that these tenants, once they're signed up, do, uh, are, are making their rent payments and they're making their agreed upon back rent payments so that we keep uh, them in line. And uh, that's the thing that's missing in most of these other moratorium projects or programs that are being offered at the city and the state level. Uh, they're just literally telling them to work together with the landlord to work out a payment system and then they let them go. There's no training, there's no classes, and there's no follow-up. So I, we're pretty sure that this is what's gonna make the difference for people who really wanna make a change in their lives. A hand up, not a hand out. Okay, so this is our time, you guys. Um, <clears throat> I can try and take one question if someone has one. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everybody.